Since we've already done videos elsewhere on the channel on some of the best mid-carters of both the new generation and attitude eras, it only makes sense that we'd cover this one next. That's right, today's the day we look at a period which, while it may not be as well remembered as the late 90s was, it arguably had an even more stacked roster. But with the likes of Brock Lesnar, John Cena, Dave Bautista, and Randy Orton all coming to the forefront. But of course, while these were all in the main event, the mid-card was equally as strong as it had been in years prior. So join us today as we take a deep dive into Workhorse's The Ruthless Aggression Era's Greatest Mid-Carders. And why not start off with one of the best mid-carders of not only the Ruthless Aggression era then, but any era in fact, because no matter what time period you place him in, Shelton Benjamin will always be one of the most talented performers on a roster. Of course, even before he joined WWE, however, he was proving this with his success on the amateur wrestling scene, with him at one point becoming an NJCAA collegiate wrestling champion. So deciding to take these skills and apply them to the world of the pros then, Benjamin would sign a contract with WWE in 2000, with him spending the next couple of years after this in Ohio Valley Wrestling, all before he was called up to the main roster in 2002. And that was where things would really get going, because being paired up with both his fellow amateur wrestler Charlie Haas and Olympic gold medalist Kurt Angle at this point, the rookie would find quick success as one of the hottest future prospects the company had. Yes, after less than a month on the roster, Benjamin had already gotten to work on winning gold when he and Haas became tag team champions together. And from there, the hits would keep on rolling, as the world's greatest tag team would spend the months that followed retaining against the likes of Los Guerreros. But this wouldn't even be the peak of Shelton's run as it happened because, clearly being positioned as the breakout star of the team after a while, he'd be moved over to Raw in March of 2004, where he began embarking on a singles career. And once there, it wouldn't take him long to prove he was just as good as a singles act either, because after turning face and scoring three victories over Triple H in short succession, he would become Intercontinental Champion after pinning Chris Jericho at that October's Taboo Tuesday. That's right, it seemed like it was only a matter of time before the gold standard would reach the main event at this point, but sadly, after losing the IC strap in 2005, things would begin to flounder. And while some have argued that this was because of his lack of personality, it didn't change the fact that when it came time for the bell to ring, there were few better than him, something which always kept fans on his side no matter what. But it wasn't all in-ring talent that made for a great mid-carter during the Ruthless Aggression era, of course, as while Shelton was bringing it with his technical skills, on the other end of the spectrum, one of the best heel characters of the time, The Miz, was making a name for himself with promos and smarmy character work. Yes, he's never going to be accused of being Brian Danielson in the ring, but when it comes to getting a reaction from fans, Michael Mizanin has always been able to get a reaction like few others. And this was no different when he first showed up in 2004, fresh off of a run on the MTV reality show The Real World, as instantly drawing the ire of fans everywhere he went with boy band good looks and his brash and cocky attitude, he would quickly rise up the ranks of Ohio Valley Wrestling. So seeing what level of villain they had on their hands, WWE would call him up to the main roster a couple of years later where, as part of the SmackDown brand, The Miz would now get to expose himself to a wider audience. And as it turned out, this wider audience hated him just as much as the developmental one had, leading to the rookie finding a solid spot for himself in the mid-card as the weeks and months went on. But he wasn't just limited to the blue brand, of course, because at one point, he would temporarily make the jump over to the revamped ECW too, something which only made fans hate him that much more as, to them, the hardcore promotion was still a sacred one not to be sullied by sports entertainers. That said, those same fans would soon have to get used to the new version of the extreme promotion they were seeing, one which The Miz became something of a poster boy for, well, during his feuds with the likes of Balls Mahoney and CM Punk. Then once this was done, he would return to SmackDown where, now teaming with John Morrison, The Miz would reach his highest peak yet. Yes, it was here that, with each man's douchebaggery amplifying the others, Miz and Morrison would turn into one of the top tag teams of the era, at one point even becoming tag team champions together. But of course, he wasn't the only mid-carter of the Ruthless Aggression era who had his eyes on winning gold at the time, as while The Miz was riding high in the tag team division, Carlito was bringing some of his trademark Caribbean cool to both the Intercontinental and European title ones. 
But while the former real-world star was always stronger with his character work, Carlito was able to balance both this and the in-ring side, as not content with just having a killer gimmick immediately upon his debut in 2004, he'd also be more than able to hold his own as a worker. That was how, after catching on with fans early on as a result of his laid-back attitude and his penchant for spitting apple in the face of his opponents, the rookie would rise to the level of number one contender for John Cena's United States title, with him ultimately defeating him during the eventual showdown to win his first singles gold. After that, Carlito would prove to be a recurring problem for the Doctor of Thugonomics, all well, simultaneous to this, he was going on an undefeated streak of his own. But while that would come to an end eventually, it wouldn't mark the close of the Puerto Rican's push, as following his loss of the US belt later that year, he'd simply move over to Raw, where he next set his sights on winning the Intercontinental title. And just like he'd done on SmackDown before then, it wouldn't take long for him to become the king of the mid-card on the red brand too, with all this being solidified when he pinned Shelton Benjamin almost immediately upon being drafted. So it seemed like a no-brainer he'd be main event bound following this, but it turned out it would never quite happen, because much like the character he portrayed on screen, Carlos Colon would have something of a laid-back attitude behind the scenes too, with this causing more than a few powerful people backstage to label him as lazy. And this would be his undoing in the end as, despite being a main event level gimmick, Carlito would never rise any higher than where he was at that point. Still, it didn't stop him thriving there for a while longer, getting to feud with the likes of Ric Flair and Jeff Hardy, all before starting a short-lived tag team with the former that went down well with fans. But while Carlito is still fondly remembered by audiences to this day, when it comes to the gimmicks of the Ruthless Aggression era who ruled the mid-card, there may be none who were more popular than Eugene. Who was Eugene? Well, it's certainly not a character that would be okayed today. But at the time, fans did fall in love with the mentally challenged kayfabe nephew of then Raw general manager Eric Bischoff when he hit the red brand in the middle of the decade. That's right, this one could have very easily gone wrong if it was played incorrectly. So it's lucky then that Nick Dinsmore, the man behind the character, was excellent in the role, with the idea behind the whole thing being that, while he may have been a little slow at other things in life, when it came to wrestling, Eugene was a savant. And this would catch on with fans in such a big way that, pretty quickly after his debut in 2004, he'd have become one of the top babyfaces on Raw, with him forming an odd couple pairing with William Regal at this point, which saw the Englishman get to flex some of his paternal skills. Then after that, Eugene even had a brief run in the main event scene when Triple H, still in his reign of terror mode, saw an opportunity to get involved in the momentum by starting a feud with the fan-favorite underdog. This, however, would ultimately lead to the gimmick starting to lose some of its luster then as, after failing to beat the game on multiple occasions, Eugene would fall back down the card. And due to the limitations of the character he was portraying, Nick Dinsmore would struggle to evolve things past there, causing the whole thing to get pretty stale by a certain point. Still, that's not to say there weren't highlights after this, as by November of that year, both he and William Regal would have become tag team champions together. Hell, following that, he continued to remain a prominent mid-card act, at one point even scoring a notable win over Kurt Angle. Yes, even if things weren't as hot as they had once been, there was still a spot for Eugene on the roster. That was until the company made the baffling decision to turn him heel in 2006, pretty much killing any love fans still had left for him in the process. But of course, he wasn't the only mid-card act who struggled to remain relevant after his initial burst of popularity in the mid-2000s WWE as, despite getting over with fans early on, Chris Masters would find it hard to maintain this over a long period of time. And that's even sadder because, unlike Eugene, there weren't really any built-in limitations on what Masters could have been, as with his impressive physique and competent in-ring skills, he should have been the kind of person Vince McMahon happily shot to the moon. At least initially then, it looked like this was what was going to happen, as after debuting in February 2005 looking like the second coming of Lex Luger, the rookie would proceed to challenge anyone on the roster to break his devastating finishing move, the Master Lock. Of course, no matter how much the baby faces might have tried to do so in the weeks and months that followed, none of them would be able to get the better of the masterpiece. And this then would all lead to Masters rising up the card as a top heel in waiting, one who would soon find himself mixing it up in the ring with the likes of Shawn Michaels, Kurt Angle, Bobby Lashley, and John Cena. 
Sadly though, despite his attempts to take the WWE title from the latter in late 2005, the result would not go the masterpiece's way. And to make matters worse, come 2006, after he'd decided to go after the Intercontinental title instead, he'd fail to win this one too. But then, in his defense, it wasn't his in-ring work which put the kibosh on this one. No, it was his decision to take time away and enter drug rehab after having developed an addiction to painkillers. So you'd think then, when he returned, the company would just pick up right where they left off. That of course is where you'd be wrong, because when he did come back to TV, now having lost a significant amount of muscle mass after quitting using steroids too, Vince McMahon would decide he didn't see as much of the young prospect anymore. Yes, Vince McMahon has often been accused of being fickle, especially when it comes to body types, and by that point, he'd already moved on to someone else who he saw as being a potential future star in the company. And who was that? Well, it's the next person in our list. The one, the only, Mr. Kennedy! Kennedy! Now, Obviously, it would be hard for the boss not to see dollars when he looked at Kennedy as, with his stellar mic skills and impressive look, it was clear he was a star in waiting. And that was why, immediately upon his debut in 2005, the newcomer would start going on an undefeated streak, playing the cocky heel who initially mowed through lower card talents like Funaki and Hardcore Holly. Soon enough following this then, Kennedy would have graduated to hunting bigger game, as by November of that year, he'd have started a feud with Eddie Guerrero. And with this taking him to the next level, it wouldn't be long before he'd won his first gold by pinning Bobby Lashley for the United States title. After that, there appeared to be no stopping the train, as with Vince being very high on the heel champion, to the point where he was associating him on screen with the McMahon family. Plans were made for Kennedy to win the 2007 Money in the Bank ladder match at WrestleMania 23. And while this would happen, it would also lead to the first stumble for the Chosen One as, despite having a WWE title shot ready to be cashed in at a moment's notice, he would never actually get a chance to use it following a tricep injury which forced him to drop the briefcase to Edge instead. Once that went down, things would never quite reach the same heights again, and despite later getting a starring role in the WWE Studios film Behind Enemy Lines Columbia, by 2009, the once thought future top star of the company would be released from his contract, with this allegedly coming about after Randy Orton had gone to Vince McMahon and convinced the boss he was unsafe in the ring. But safety in the ring was never something in question for our next figure because, well, he may not have quite reached the main event level, when it came to mid-card talent that everyone was happy to work with, you needn't look any further than MVP and his run during the Ruthless Aggression era would all begin in August of 2006, as it was then that he would make his debut on SmackDown, being portrayed as the hottest free agent in the industry. So like any hot free agent, MVP would quickly seek to make a name for himself by going after one of the biggest dogs in the yard, with this being Kane. And while that would end badly for him when he was set on fire by the Big Red Machine during an Inferno match a few months later, he would be able to bounce back quickly as, come 2007, he'd have become the United States Champion upon beating Chris Benoit in a 2 out of 3 falls match. After that, he'd further prove his worth by successfully defending against the likes of Ric Flair and Matt Hardy, with the latter feud even seeing the new champ get knocked out by boxing legend Evander Holyfield at one point. But even if he was taking the odd punch here or there, it wouldn't stop him from holding on to the US strap for a full 343 days before things were all said and done. And once it was done, not content with just resting on his laurels, MVP would move over to Raw, where he continued to be a standout of the mid-card, there temporarily teaming up with Mark Henry, all while simultaneously continuing to go it solo against performers such as The Miz. After that settled down, he'd enter into an on-screen mentor role of sorts for NXT rookie Percy Watson. And of course, he wasn't the only mid-card performer in WWE who would end up taking on such a task in the years that followed, though when Finley eventually did it, it was largely behind the scenes instead. Before he was responsible for taking women's wrestling and helping to shape it into what it is today, however, the Irishman was busy making a name for himself as one of the most legit tough guys on WWE's mid-card during the Ruthless Aggression era. And this all began in 2006 when he introduced himself by pummeling Matt Hardy on an episode of SmackDown, from there continuing on in such fashion over the weeks and months that followed as he took on the likes of Bobby Lashley and Chris Benoit. 
But that wasn't all he was doing at this time as, on top of that, he'd also form an alliance with Hornswoggle, a supposed Irish leprechaun who often came out from under the ring to help him win his matches. And it was alongside Hornswoggle that Finley would later become a member of then World Heavyweight Champion King Booker's court too, with them here joining the likes of Queen Charmel and Finley's old rival William Regal. Yes, it was a good spot for the Irishman, and one which allowed him to regularly get TV time so as to show what he could do in the ring, all of which led to him being a bit of a cult favorite among hardcore fans. As this was happening, however, one figure who did not have such popularity with hardcore fans was also carving out a spot for himself over on Raw, and that was Gene Snitsky. Sure, we know he may not have been a great wrestler, certainly not in the league of someone like Fit Finley. And we know he may not have even had great promo skills either. What Snitsky did have though, in 2004, was the backing of Vince McMahon. And this meant that he would be rocketed up the card when he entered into a feud with Kane and Lita that very year, with the rookie heel actually getting on-screen credit for causing the latter to miscarry her child after he'd knocked her off the ring apron. Yes, this one wasn't great, but it did at least give us the absolutely ludicrous moment of Snitsky coming out to the ring with a child's doll the following week, punting it into the crowd from there as he shouted out his catchphrase, It wasn't my fault! But whether it was his fault or not, the boss had become so enamored by the rookie on account of his physique by this point that he would continue to push him as a monster heel regardless, giving him kayfabe credit for injuring Kane a few weeks later too. After that, still being involved in the whole Kane and Lita storyline, Snitsky would be used as a pawn by Edge as he tried to come between the on-screen couple. And this, as it turned out, would be the moment where Gene added a further wrinkle to his character when he revealed himself to have a foot fetish, something which would be played up for laughs in the weeks and months that followed. Was it the best gimmick ever? No, but it did continue to give him a regular spot on the mid-card of Raw. And when that ran its course, it would also allow him the opportunity to jump over to the revamped ECW for a while, there getting to take on the likes of CM Punk, Rob Van Dam, and then ECW champion Bobby Lashley. ECW, however, would not be a spot that our final entry today would ever find himself stopping at, because by the time Paul Heyman's hardcore promotion had been revived under Vince McMahon's banner in 2006, He'd have already made the jump over to Japan, where he rebuilt himself in the main event as Giant Bernard. Prior to this though, he'd have a fairly successful run on the WWE midcard during the Ruthless Aggression era too, with him there going by the name of A-Train. But that should have come as no surprise to fans of his as, before, Matt Bloom, the man behind the gimmick, had already found a solid spot in the midcard during the Attitude Era when he wrestled as Prince Albert, a tattoo artist turned professional wrestler. And while this period would see him form a successful partnership with Test and Trish Stratus, followed by a less successful partnership with X-Pac and Just Incredible, it wouldn't be until 2002 that he would get a more prominent run. So, changing his name up to A-Train at this point, he would align himself with The Big Show and Paul Heyman, as at WrestleMania 19 in March of that year, both he and The Giant would challenge The Undertaker's streak in a handicap match. Of course, the heel duo wouldn't win this one in the end, and that would ultimately lead to A-Train going it solo over on SmackDown from there for a while as he, once again, became a regular fixture of the mid-card, getting involved in matches against the likes of Chris Benoit, Bradshaw, and Kurt Angle. Then, once that was done, Bloom would move over to Raw for a while where he got to take on a whole new host of opponents like Val Venus and Chris Jericho. And while this did seem to be a good spot for him, a rotator cuff injury would end up putting him on the shelf for a few months, with this stalling any momentum he had to the point that, by November of that year, he'd be released from his contract. But as we said, A-Train would go over to Japan and turn himself into a main eventer following this, with that all leading to him returning to WWE as Lord Tensai in 2012 and scoring a pinfall over none other than John Cena. So it just goes to show that being in the mid-card doesn't mean you can never ascend to a higher level. And even if you don't ultimately end up doing this, as every single figure in this video has shown us, it doesn't mean you're not important. No, quite the opposite in fact. So long as you can find that niche which entertains fans, you can still be a memorable part of the show each and every week. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.